Praise the Lord, everyone. Here we are again at another edition of 153greatfish.com. As promised, we are going to study the uh, cliff prophecy tonight between Daniel 11.35 and Daniel 11.36. Now, this can be a confusing Bible study. I'm going to try to give you the cipher key, the cipher key to understand uh, what Daniel's talking about tonight. If you get this, the book of Revelation is going to open up to you. But let's pray. Jesus, I pray for the people that are listening tonight, that are watching tonight. God, I pray you would anoint their minds. Help all of us, Lord God, to understand your word, which you try to say to us in prophetic language. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, here we go. Uh, right, right to the PowerPoint as usual. We're talking about the Time Cliff Prophecy tonight, and here is our outline. Symbolic language of Gabriel. That's probably the most important thing you're going to get tonight, as the way I understand it. Daniel 11.35 is 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He was a Greek king. We'll talk more about him in detail. Daniel 11.36 this is the last three and a half years before rapture, the time of the Antichrist. And the purpose of Daniel 11.35 to 11.36 is to demonstrate the similarities and the timing differences between these two people, Antiochus and Antichrist. So we're going to contrast two beasts and two time periods of tribulation. And then we're going to talk about the second abomination, which Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24. So, symbolic language, let's get started with it. The prophetic scriptures repeatedly point to a single man of history as a type and shadow of the main character of the end time, that is, the Antichrist. It seems that God wants the church to know, without a doubt, who the greatest liar in history will be. In three visions given to Daniel by God, Daniel is supplied with a narrator, Gabriel, the archangel messenger, this messenger is the one who stands in the presence of God's heavenly council. And these visions are all about the restoration of Israel and also about how Israel comes into the church. Can you say praise the Lord? Three visions. In the three visions, two main actors on the world's timeline are revealed. They oppose each other. They are the Messiah. He is the truth, the way, and the name of life. And Belial, the lying counterfeit death, the name of blasphemy, obviously the Antichrist. And here you'll see Daniel <laughs> talking to Gabriel. Symbolic language continued. Erev Boker. These are two Hebrew words. This is temple language. It means evening and morning. If the Erev is left off and it's just Boker, it still means evening and morning. What does it mean? This is the cipher key. This phrase right here is the cipher key. You'll find it in Genesis 1, the evening and the morning were the first day. And everything that God made was good, except for one thing. It's not good for the man to be alone. Era of Boker, evening and morning, is a cipher key of the Daniel 8 vision. While he was living in Susa, Iran, which was located on the river Ulai. It's a counting mechanism, meaning twice daily sacrifice. And you'll see this thing show up in Daniel 8, 12 through 14, specifically in 14. Boker, it's a temple term. So Gabriel is revealing the cipher key, which we later learn becomes relevant and understandable at the time of the end. These are the things that it will mean, three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. This cipher key reappears in the book of Revelation. Sorry, I spelled that wrong in the book of Revelation. Just coming back up to this temple term, daily sacrifice. When it says sacrifice, it's twice daily, two times a day. So anything that's using this phrase here has to be divided by two. We're going to get to that. So the Jews, they knew that their judgment for idolatry in the priesthood would be fulfilled when the vile man of the Greek empire would arrive. His name is Antiochus IV, 168 B.C., we're going to learn a little more about him. Now, some of the other symbols in the book of Daniel in these three visions that will help us. Ram, that's a beast which signifies a world empire. 
The ram had two horns, that is the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians together, two horns, Daniel 8.20. It was soon to arise and defeat Babylon. A horn represents a power or a spirit upon a leader of a kingdom. And of course, you'll find this uh, idea throughout the book of Revelation. Two horns on one head. This is a merger of two powers that combine and act as one. This symbol will occur again in Revelation where four horns act as one on one of seven heads of the terrible multi-headed beast empire under the leadership of the little horn, the foreseen Antichrist. <laughs> so there it is. That's the symbol. The rough goat with one horn. This is undivided power or leader of the Greek empire. Notice, this looks exactly like the little horn of Revelation. The rough goat with one horn, the undivided power or leader of the Greek Empire. The king of fierce countenance, this is the last vile king of the Greek Empire who will destroy Judah, defile the temple because of the priestly transgression. When was that done? Ezekiel tells us about it in Ezekiel 8.3. He peered through the keyhole in the wall of the temple and he saw syncretism the priests of God mixing two religions or more together. So this is clearly the king of, us, uh, of fierce countenance is Antiochus Epiphanes, a type and shadow of Antichrist. Ezekiel 8.3, as I said, shows the keyhole vision of the temple, the priests of syncretism. And that was the purpose for the judgment on the sanctuary. Symbolic language, talking about Daniel. The king of fierce countenance stands up twice in Daniel 11, 21 through 34. He first subdues the holy people. That means the priesthood. He subdues them with prosperity and peace while he defiles the sanctuary. Sounds like the modern day church, doesn't it? Prosperity gospel. We will never suffer. We'll get raptured before the tribulation. So he destroys them with prosperity and peace while defiling the sanctuary the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem by erecting the abomination of desolation. However, when he stands up the second time, he does so against the Prince of Princes. Who's this? It's not Jesus. This is a term for Judas the Maccabean. He was a captain of captains. He was a military genius. He subdued Antiochus from 167 to 160, but he was also a priest, a Kohen. He was a member of the Aaronic priesthood. He was cleansing the temple, the holy place of Antiochus abomination. We're going to see what that abomination is. Most interpreters view the first, the, the fierce countenance king as Antiochus IV Epiphanes, meaning the god of light. He is the, I'm going to try to pronounce this Greek word, Seleucid, Greek king of Syria. Okay, and he was that king from 215 to 164. The Greek Empire divided into four, then divided into two. The, the kingdom to the north is Seleucid. Now, he was a precursor to the end time man of sin that Paul talks about. Jesus predicted the future reemergence of this well-known destroyer when he was on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24. After Jesus had been rejected himself by a corrupt priesthood of his time, that very day in Jerusalem, just a few hours before his passion. Here's the scripture, Matthew 24, 15 through 18. This is a summary. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation <clears throat> spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Jesus uttered this prophecy immediately after being rejected by a corrupt priesthood. A corrupt priesthood. Here you see the Greek empire. Here you see to the north, Antioch, Seleucid, the north, Ptolemy was to the south. This guy came down, conquered Jerusalem, and he did some bad things. We're going to talk about that. This is the remnant of Alexander the Great's empire. Symbolic language. So the prince of princes in Daniel is the Maccabean priest of Aaronic lineage, Judas Maccabeus, also known as the hammer, the military genius. He perfects something called asymmetric warfare against the Syrian Greek armies, and he prevails. He prevails over everybody. He breaks the, he breaks the king, Judas breaks the king of first countenance with something that is not a traditional war strategy. 
Yet Gabriel did not define this for Daniel. Judas Maccabeus executed what has become known as guerrilla war, also known as asymmetric war. He started a guerrilla war campaign and defeated the Greeks and drove them out of the temple, out of Jerusalem, and began to back them off out of the Holy Land. Now, this phrase shows up, 2300 days, Erev Boker, shows up in Daniel uh, chapter 11, evening and morning sacrifice. There's 2300 days of abomination, the Bible says in Daniel. This is the duration of the prophecy detailing the time of the first pollution, meaning the erection of a statue of Jupiter and Zeus by Epiphanes. Now, what Epiphanes did is when he erected the statue, it was common for the Greeks and the Romans to erect a statue of Zeus or Jupiter. And what he did, Epiphanes put his own head on that statue and he put it in the temple. So he polluted it, the temple sanctuary, and then he prohibited sacrifices until it was cleansed three years and some months later. So the statue was removed by Judas Maccabeus. Now, 2300 days is kind of mysterious. We're going to talk about that. Keep in mind that in Daniel 8 prophecy, he describes the 167 to 164 BC abomination, whereas some of the Daniel 11 and all of Daniel 12 describe the end time desecration of the temple. We're going to talk about this split that happens at the cliff. Okay, so this 2300 days, if you divide it by 360, you're going to get six plus years. But remember, heir of Boker means two sacrifices one day. So this number must be divided by two to get the timeline, which yields the three years and some one month and a few days of this time period. So let's go back to that. In Daniel 8, 14, the term Boker means two sacrifices for, per day. Therefore, 8, 14 says 2300 divided by two. That's 1150 days. This is the exact time. The abomination, the pollution, the statue stood in the Holy of Holies three years and 70 days. Now, I could take you to the book of Maccabees and prove this exactly. The book of Maccabees, First and Second Maccabees, is not a biblical book. It's a book of the Jews. It's a history book of this time of Judas Maccabeus and Antiochus Epiphanes. And I can prove this is exactly the time period that that statue was in the holy place uh, at the temple, the statue of Zeus, Jupiter, with Antiochus Epiphanes' head on the top. So, the 1150 days prophecy is a cipher. It's a cipher. To the future second desecration of the end time temple. You can read about that desecration in Daniel 12, 11 through 12. It uses these two, these two days, 1290 and 1335, three years, seven months, and three years, eight months, 15 days. So what the Bible is telling us in Daniel is that the Antichrist will enter into the temple in the end time, three years, seven months, and three years, eight months. In other words, the statue will stay up for three years and seven months, and then it's cleansed three years and eight months and 15 days, okay? So here it's taken down, here it's cleansed, the temple. But what is the end time temple? Will the end time temple be rebuilt, a physical temple, like a lot of preachers are telling you today? This Bible study is gonna get even more interesting now that you understand the cipher. There's Antiochus, as Zeus, and here's a man who claims to be Holy Father. The Bible says, call no man Father, and God alone is holy. If you claim to be holy, that's abomination. If you claim to be the Father, you're doing the same thing as Antiochus Epiphanes did when he erected that statue at the temple, and he caused them to stop the sacrifices, and if there was going to be any sacrifice, it would be to him. Symbolic language, the cliff. So he erects the statue of himself as Zeus in the holy place, the temple of Jerusalem. He forbids circumcision and the abomination of desolation idol in 167 BC causes division 
and civil war among the priests in Jerusalem. They begin to fight each other. Those who want a job and want to please Antiochus and those who want to cleanse the temple and get this Greek monstrosity out of the temple. There's something about Greek, whether it be philosophy or statues, that bothers the Lord. Can you say praise God? Antiochus installs a man named Menelaus as high priest. He was a Cohen, but he was favorable towards Antiochus. And then he attacks Jerusalem during the Maccabee revolt. This is a civil war that's happening among the priests. He kills 40,000 people in three days in 167 BC. He is drunk with the blood of the priesthood, is he not? So civil war commences in Jerusalem between the traditional Cohens and the Hellenized priests, Greek cultured Cohens of Antiochus, 167 BC. The faithful Cohens, the Zedekites, they remove themselves to Qumran with scrolls and they complete their uh, removal and transportation of scrolls by 155 BC. They perceived that the Maccabean priests were just as unfaithful to the Torah as the uh, <clears throat> Menelaus priests that, that uh, Antiochus hired. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they rise out of the Maccabees to control the temple and the vestments of the high priesthood, eventually handing them over to the Romans in 64 BC. And let's contrast the two beasts that the Bible's telling us about in Daniel. Daniel saw two desecrations of the temple in three visions. Since the first desecration was in the time period of the Maccabean era, 167 BC, when Jesus references Daniel's predicted second desecration, we think it's going to occur shortly in the modern Christian era. It could very well be happening right now. When somebody jumps into the church and says, I am Christ. I am the Pope. I'm the Papa. I'm the Father. We have the abomination of desolation. The holy place, the church, is being desecrated. This is the reason for the cliff prophecy between Daniel 11.35 and Daniel 11.36. There's two desecrations in the holy place. Two vile conquerors of fierce countenance. God is giving us a profile of the destroyer through the character and history of Antiochus Epiphanes IV and the hard resistor Judas Maccabeus. It is a type. It's a predictive prophecy. It's an anti-type revealing what the Antichrist will be like. Let's read these two scriptures, the Cliff Prophecy, Daniel 11.35. And many of those who understand shall stumble to refine and to purge them and to make white to the time of the end, meaning the end of the temple period, for it is yet for the appointed time. Now verse 36, here's the cliff. Going uh, 164 plus 2018, I think we're up to 2082 or something, I think. <laughs> and the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall even speak marvelous things against the god of gods. He shall prosper until the day until the fury is completed for that which is decreed shall be done why does god bring antiochus epiphanes into a corrupt priesthood in 167 bc it's because they had mixed two religions together and let me tell you something in christianity today we have syncretism we have mixed greek philosophy Logos theology of John chapter 1 from the Greeks instead of Psalm 119. We have polluted the dictionary of the scriptures. We have accepted Greek philosophy as our definition for the Son of God. We've created an eternal Son. We've created a trinity of beings. We have syncretized Christianity. And this is why God allows an Antiochus Epiphanes to rise up into the holy place of the church. Can you say praise the Lord? So the second abomination is coming. In Daniel 12, 11 through 12, the phrase Erev Boker, like I said, does not reappear when connected to the daily sacrifice being taken away as it did in Daniel 8, 14. The term used after that is Yom, which translates day. Yom is a non-temple term, whereas Erev Boker is a temple term for daily daily sacrifice morning and evening so 
Keep in mind that in Daniel 8.14, the term heir of Boker was translated days by the King James guys. But it's definitely a physical temple term, and it fools us into understanding the book of Daniel. So, Daniel 12, 11 through 12, and from the time that the daily sacrifice, that is the word, yam, shall be taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Yam. Got it? Yam. One thousand two ninety. That's a regular day. Don't need to divide by two. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the thousand three hundred and fifty thirty fifth day. Yam. That's when it's cleansed. I think we're talking about the rapture. Thus, we can conclude that Daniel 12, 11 through 12, is not talking about a physical temple where the abomination of desolation occurs at a second future date. Okay, it can't be talking about a physical temple because if it did, it would be using the word Booker. But it's not. It's using the word Yam. So there can't be a second temple built. <laughs> we just proved it in Hebrew. Oh boy. So the question now becomes, what is a second future abomination and desolation if there is no physical temple? Uh, somebody's going to enter into the church and people will worship him as Christ, a false Christ. Can you say praise the Lord? So now that I've given you all this symbolic language, um, it's your homework assignment to read the rest of Daniel 11, 37 through the whole book of 12, and this should lead you into Revelation. And uh, that's, that's basically why we did this Bible study tonight. A um, little complex, I know, but now you understand the purpose of the cliff. God wants to contrast two men, two, that uh, he wants to give us a profile of what the Antichrist will be like, and he wants to show us that there will be no rebuilt temple the Hebrew proves it. Yom versus uh, Boker, era of Boker. You get it? Okay, praise the Lord, everyone. We'll see you next time here on another edition of 153greatfish.com.